Morning Glory. Morning. 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 Well, you know, I'm excited, um, as always, uh, how our um, band prepares us to worship and kind of ushers us in the presence. Um, just beautiful music. I am in awe, as I imagine you are too, of how God uh, works with these wonderful people and gives us, including Katie's cowbell solo. Woo! <laughs> together and it's good to celebrate um, and so we're getting ready we're getting ready um, for what God is going to do we're remembering what God has done we celebrate what God is doing and we're looking forward to what God is going to do through Jesus that's what Advent is all about and we're almost there we're almost to Christmas Eve which this year is on December 24th and uh, so we're going to have a great time I trust um, but I want to pray with you, if you would, real quick. Let's pray. Lord, uh, as we kind of dive into your word a little bit here, we pray that we hear you. And we know, Lord, that this is a sensitive time of year. we got a lot of emotions rolling through us, and as we hear your word, it, it makes things rise up and questions and challenges and maybe even some hurts, as well as some joys. We just offer it to you, Lord. We're thankful that you've promised to walk with us through everything of life. So, Lord, as we share these moments, walk with us and help us to walk with you, knowing that you got a hold of us and you're not going to let go. Help us to hear you clearly. And anything that isn't of you, Lord, just allow it to fall away from our hearing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. My uh, permanent date, my wife Sandra, is here uh, again today. And I think that's a good thing. Well, I mean, it's always good. Another reason that's a good thing is because um, I'm remembering when we're hearing about Mary and Elizabeth, I'm remembering that Sandra and I went to Lamaze classes together years ago. Um, maybe some of you have been through Lamaze classes. I remember when my mom worked, uh, when I was little, my mom worked for a family physician and he also delivered babies. I remember we go in the waiting room, it seemed like I was there a lot, it was because I got an allergy shot like every week. So I was in the doctor's office a lot. On the wall, there'd be a thing that said LeMay's classes. And I always wondered what that LeMay's meant or what I found out, what that all meant. And so Sandra and I went, and it's funny that you're just suddenly thrust in a room with all of these couples that you don't know. And we did this in Westerville, Ohio. So there were a lot of people from a lot of places there. And it's interesting to look at couples and kind of wonder how they got together. You know, and they're thinking like, wow, those guys are together. And I'm um, wondering what people thought about me and Sandra. They're probably thinking, wow, that guy outkicked his coverage. <laughs> <laughs> and still say that too. So, uh, anyway, we're there and I'm learning how to help her to breathe. So, we have two children. Eli's our oldest, Evan. And when, you know, Eli was uh, starting to move, make the move, uh, we hit the road in an hour drive to the hospital. Now, I'm not going to tell the whole story, that's for another day, but simply to say that I understood that my job to help Sandra was to help her to know how to breathe and to help keep her calm. And so we get there and she starts delivering and I'm like, wow, I can't believe this is happening and wow, I can't believe this is happening because you see stuff you just never really <laughs> <laughs> And uh, anyway, so I'm trying to help her breathe and like I'm supposed to go over and like lean her up. Now Sandra is a champ. Sandra delivered two babies without an epidural. <laughs> so I'm in great admiration of my wife and just the whole childbirth thing I am in awe. But I remember that she did that without an epidural and I'd go and I'd say, hold her up, help her to breathe and she's pushing and after a while my back started. <laughs> and I got absolutely no sympathy for that. And rightfully so. So anyway, it was to try to help her to know how to breathe and the whole birth thing to go well. But what I found out two days ago, maybe it was yesterday when Sandra and I were recounting all this, was that we went to Lamaze classes, according to my wife, to keep me calm. <laughs> did it work? And of course it did, she says yes. So. So I'm thinking about all that in terms of, you know, Mary and Elizabeth, and, and of course, uh, they didn't have Lamaze. 
And being a guy, I thought, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about pregnancy, and I have not experienced that except vicariously, so I should do a little research. So I found that there's this website called What to Expect. And if you're pregnant, you can go on to this website and it can tell you what to expect. So here's what it says. Eat this, don't eat that, work out, but not too intensely. Now that you're breathing, eating, exercising, sleeping, and more for two, you're probably hearing a lot of rules and guidelines about how you should be living life as a mom to be. From foods to avoid, and we found that out in certain food didn't want to eat. Will Eli or Evan didn't like it. From uh, foods to avoid to healthy habits to incorporate into your pregnancy lifestyle, here's your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about staying safe during pregnancy. No, they didn't have that. And Mary and Elizabeth didn't have that either. But we all want to have instruction in life, be it to have a child or just to negotiate the day-to-day -day living. We, we like to have instruction because I think many of us, on some level, feel inadequate. Imagine how Elizabeth and Mary must have felt back in the day, like 1 BC. This is all happening. So Elizabeth uh, is there in her home somewhere near Jerusalem, and, and here comes Mary, about a 70-mile trip, to visit her cousin. Mary's pregnant, Elizabeth's pregnant. And this is an amazing thing, because Elizabeth was well advanced in years, as the story says, and um, she was beyond the normal thought of childbearing. And in that society, and in that time, there was some stigma attached to that. People were kind of, and women were esteemed if they were able to have children in that culture and in that time. And because of that, Elizabeth had spent a life, undoubtedly, under some degree of ridicule. How amazing in her advanced years she became pregnant. It's one of those things where you probably can imagine her saying, wow, look what God did. And then Mary comes to visit her. And you've heard it before, and you can imagine it, I'm sure. Here's Mary. Not well to do, unmarried, young, pregnant. Elizabeth, who had probably been to some degree scorned in society, is compared to Mary, who was being scorned undoubtedly, because here she was, has this amazing story. She's not married, but she's pregnant. A vulnerable woman. And they come together. I imagine that they would have loved to have had what to expect, but undoubtedly, they didn't need the website to a degree because they were able to talk about what it is, the, the wisdom of, of bearing a child and, and what's to come. I think there's something rich about this idea of bearing the child. And I'd like for us just to journey through that together for a couple minutes this morning. It's amazing to me as well that when Elizabeth... Uh, sees Mary, she greets her and says stuff about Mary that the only way she could know was because God's Holy Spirit was at work in her life. I love the fact that Elizabeth apparently was attuned enough to God, able to listen enough to God, that God had revealed to her things about Mary that the only way that Elizabeth could have known it was if God had revealed it. And Mary must have been saying, wow, what is God going to do? Elizabeth, these things you're telling me. Elizabeth remarks how the baby leaps in her womb when Mary approaches pregnant with Jesus. She knows stuff that only could have been revealed to her by God. And so Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with God-provided understanding, greets her cousin Mary. And Mary, for her part, says something that I think is incredible. She says, God has noticed me, and he has blessed me. I want to just sit with that with you for just a moment. Remember what I said just a few moments ago, and probably something that you figured out on your own about Mary being vulnerable and not being held in esteem because she was unmarried and she was pregnant and everybody must have been saying, oh man, she must have, oh, I bet she, oh, have you heard about, oh, yeah. 
And because of God at work in her life, she's able to say, God, you've noticed me. And you've blessed me. Do you realize that just like Mary, you can speak that same phrase? God, you've noticed me. I think that's really instructive for us because Mary's in a very hard place. She's in a crisis place in many ways in her life, and yet she's able to see that God has noticed her. And I want to assure you today that God has noticed you. Whatever it is that's happening in your life, whatever it is that you're experiencing, be it good or be it bad, be it hard or be it easy, whatever it is, do you know that God has noticed you? If you walk away this morning with nothing else, I would invite you to walk away with the assurance that God has noticed you. Everything about you, all the details of your life, and loves you still, and pours out His grace toward you still, and has a purpose and a plan for you still, even though it may seem at times you wonder why, even though it may seem like it couldn't get any worse than it is, I think Mary could have understood what you're going through. But God noticed her and God has noticed you. So please remember that. And in the midst of this crisis, at least a crisis to, for everybody else, Mary is able to say, God has noticed me and he has blessed me. Are you kidding me? You're unmarried, you're young, you're vulnerable, you're pregnant. And yet Mary says, I have been blessed. In fact, Elizabeth can see the blessing too. And the cool thing about this is that Mary believed it would be done for her as it was told to her. Everything around her had to speak and cry out to something else. But she believed, and because she believed, she was blessed. You know, there are some things, that, some blessings that we experience in life that only happen because we believe. Because we take that risk of believing, even though we don't see it all. There's a musician named Michael Card, and talking about this passage, he says something pretty cool. This, this piece that Mary sings, and this is a song that Mary sings called the Magnificat, which some of you probably heard of a phrase that way, that Jeff read. This Magnificat is Mary singing more than she knows. Because she's rejoicing. And rejoicing means gratitude and unwavering trust, even when everything around points to the contrary. I'm taken back in my mind to the Garden of Eden. And over the time that we have together, however long the Lord gives us to be together, uh, as a community of faith and me with you, which I hope is like a real long time. You'll hear me refer to Genesis 3 often because it helps us to understand our predicament. You remember what we talked about that Eve was in the garden and everything was cool and they and she and Adam were with the Lord and everything was perfect. And one day the serpent shows up and it's the evil one and he starts to whisper and Eve starts to listen. And what happened in that garden was Eve listened to the serpent, and she began to distrust what God had said to her. She began to distrust God's word. She began to believe that God did not have her, she, and Adam's best interest in mind. Mind. And thus so doubt. And here comes Mary. It's kind of like Mary's the contrary to Eve. Mary realizes, so she doesn't have it all figured out. She, she can't believe this is really happening to her in some respects. And yet she believes that what had, has been said to her is going to happen. She believes that God has noticed her. And she cries out in song, what an incredible thing. I don't understand it all. I can't believe it all, but I'm going to believe it because God has said it. And I'm going to trust where I have not yet seen. And so she rejoices an unwavering trust and gratitude as she carries this child. And I think about that word rejoicing because in Philippians, another letter in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at his town called Philippi. And he writes it from Rome. And, and actually Paul's in prison at the time. He's got chains on his legs. He, 
has some people that can come and see him and everything, but he's still under arrest. He is a prisoner. He's not free to go and to do everything he wants to go and to do. And he says something in chapter 4, verse 4, which is amazing. He says, rejoice in all things. Again, I say, rejoice. And there's a part of you that wants to say, dude, you're in prison. Are you not realizing your situation? Are you denying reality? How can you say, rejoice in all things again? I say, rejoice. And I think it's amazing because, you see, there's, there's someone that Paul is carrying with him. There is someone who has captured him. And even in his captivity, Paul realizes that he carries someone with him that's never going to leave him. You know who that is. It's Jesus. If I dare say it, it's almost like Paul is pregnant with Jesus. He's got this Jesus life welling up in him. He's got this Jesus life that has given purpose and hope to his life. It's like he's carrying this newborn king himself. I know it sounds kind of weird to say, but he's carrying him. And everybody's beginning to see it. Dude, you're, you're pregnant with God. It's like, I know. Okay, it doesn't say that in the Bible, but I'm inferring that. I believe that Paul is saying, I've got this Jesus in line with me, and it's making all the difference. So even though I'm a prisoner, I know this isn't the end of things. I know there's something more. There's something bigger because it's of God. I don't have it all figured out, but I know that God is. I've got this Jesus in me, and I'm going to carry him to turn. Rejoice. Are you ready to rejoice? To have this deep gratitude and unwavering trust that in the midst of whatever it is helps you to know that Jesus is alive and alive in you. He's got great plans for you and for us together. And so as Mary sings her song, she says some very cool things. I love it. She says, she sings this. God shows mercy. He lifts up the humble and the lowly. He fills the hungry. He helps his people. And what else? He keeps his promises. There are, there are a bazillion, is that a number? A bazillion promises of God in his word. But I just want to lift up one section of the promises that Mary is singing about. She says he keeps his promises. What are these promises? If, if you look in Micah, one of those Old Testament prophets that Pastor Paul alluded to a few weeks ago. You know those folks that used to talk and all of a sudden 400 years of nothing until John the Baptist came? One of those prophets, Micah. Here's what he said, chapter 7. Where is the God who can compare with you? Listen to this, friends. Listen to this about you. Wiping the slate clean of guilt. Turning a blind eye, a deaf ear to the past sins of your purged and precious people. God, you don't nurse your anger and you don't stay angry long. For mercy is your specialty. That's what you love most. And compassion is on its way to us. You'll stamp out our wrongdoing. You'll sink our sins to the bottom of the ocean. You'll stay true to your word. You see, those promises that were made to the people of Israel, we get to get in on now because of Jesus. Because every human being on planet Earth is invited into this beautiful relationship with God through Jesus. And it is God's desire that every human being would come to know his son. And to find salvation in his name. You see, Mary is singing this song of rejoicing, and we are invited to sing along with her too because of this unshakable trust and gratitude that we can have for what God has done and for what God is doing. Mary. And so I ask, do you have Mary trust? Do you have Mary rejoicing? There's something on that website, that what to expect website, that kind of caught my interest that I want to kind of close with. 
There's a little section on there, a little tab you can click on for pregnancy safety. Now, I'm not in Sandra's head, which is probably good. So I don't know exactly what her fears and concerns were, although we talked, and we still talk, you know, about life together. But here's what it said on there. In terms of pregnancy safety, it says, first things first, don't worry. Quote, your body is perfectly capable and actually created to do what you're doing right now. Building a life. That's one of the pregnancy safety messages that the people who host this website want pregnant mothers to know. I'll say it again. Your body is perfectly capable and actually created to do what you're doing right now, building a life. You see, in Paul the Apostle, when he was chained and imprisoned, God had been building a life in him and was continuing to do that. And I want to assure you that God is about building a life in you, the life of Jesus, to be alive in you. You see, friends, he's taken notice of you. He's taken notice of us. And what he's doing in you, he's also doing in us together. You know, the church, we've talked about this before, the church is the body of Christ. Christ is building himself into our midst, into our life together. And the more room we give him, the more attention we pay to him, the greater is the growth that is in us. Greater is the one who is in us than who is in the world. God is in love with you. He has sent Jesus to save you and to save me and to save us. And he wants to be alive in you. Friends, we can, if you will, carry Jesus as Mary carried him. Because Mary, when she heard from the angels that she was going to give birth, pondered everything he said in her heart. And I invite you to join me in pondering everything that Jesus says to us in our hearts and allow him to change our world one day at a time. I'm going to invite the band to come. And I just want to say to you, please remember, That at great cost, but out of great love, God has sent Jesus, born of a virgin, so that we might have life. And remember, friends, that God is always for you. God is not against you. Let us pray. Merciful God, you blow our mind with your truth and with your love, that you would be born into our midst through one of us by the power of your Holy Spirit still truly boggles our minds. We pray, Lord, that it will come alive again to us, the mystery of it, the amazement of it, that you will help us to know we don't have to have it all figured out, that you will help us to believe where we have not yet seen that you will help us to trust in things that perhaps we have not yet experienced. Knowing that the most true thing of all of life is you and your love for your creation. We pray in Jesus. Rejoice. <laughs>